Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's Coffee Morning. We've got an exciting lineup today as we're celebrating the launch of all three of this year's strategic priority projects. Um, and the strategic priority support mechanism is actually an important part of what we do in the Earth Institute, and it's really great to see such excellent projects emerging through it. So thanks very much to everyone involved, including the teams, and, and particularly Katrina, who, who, who runs the programme. So given the time frame, I won't say any more. I'll leave it to the project leaders to introduce the projects, starting first with, with Graham Warren, Sam Kelly, and Christine Bonin, who will introduce you, the UCD Mountain Research Group. Morning, everyone. Finding a way of unmuting, unmuting things here. Um, can I check that you can all see a screen which looks vaguely mountain related at, at this stage? Excellent. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. So, yeah, delighted to, to have the opportunity to speak very briefly to you um, about the uh, idea that myself, Sam, and Christine had to form a, a UCD mountain research group. And we're delighted to have um, support from the Earth Institute as a strategic. For 2021-22. Really, we just wanted in um, five or six minutes to uh, give a very brief introduction to, to the, the background to this group, what we hope it might achieve, and extend an invitation to you all to, to, to hopefully be part of this and see and see what we can develop and, and build from there. So the, the, the background to this really comes out of relationships between myself, Sam, and Christine, and between the schools of, of sciences, archaeology, and geography uh, around mountains in different ways. So mountains, or the, what they sometimes call the field of, of montology, is, is in, inherently an, an interdisciplinary um, task. And the, the schools of earth sciences, archaeology, and geography have collaborated in lots of ways um, around this and a group of geographers and archaeology and historians as well. We let historians and sometimes um, at Glendalock down in the down in the bottom here, and then some images from fieldwork from from Christine, Sam, and myself. Sam and I um, collaborated on developing a, an IRC Coalesce funded application last year, which I can finally confirm that we were actually awarded. Um, Christine and I and colleagues in geography are involved in funding applications um, at the moment. And it was out of those, those conversations and those networks really facilitated by the Earth Institute that the idea of putting together a, a proposal for a centre, which would, a, a research group, sorry, that would bring together people at UCD and beyond who were studying mountains um, arose. And, and with that kind of background, I'll hand over to Christine. Thanks, Graham. So to give you some, some context, I guess, for our initiative, um, mountains are really overlooked, we think, but yet very important landscape type in Ireland and Europe and indeed globally. Um, they're essential to global sustainability. They're sources of biodiversity, water, fresh water, energy, food and livelihoods. Uh, and they contain vital natural and cultural heritage resources and records. These landscapes are dynamically balanced, but they're being faced with a host of new social economic and environmental pressures that are all happening concurrently. Uh, they're often hazard prone uh, landscapes and acutely impacted by climate change. And this um, piece in the conversation just came out a couple of days ago, highlights that really well. Mountains are recognized in the sustainable development goals, but rather narrowly. Uh, while the challenges that they face need an interdisciplinary approach and perspective, and that's what we seek to develop with MRG. In Ireland, there have been two recent reviews, one by Mountaineering Ireland and the other by Irish Uplands Forum. Um, and these provide a strong platform for uh, our development and we're collaborating with them. And there's also important local parallels to our initiative like the Center for Mountain Studies at Perth College and we're building ties with them as well. So our aims are what we intend to achieve through the MRG are to firstly highlight the importance of mountain landscapes and the value of taking this interdisciplinary approach to mountains for many of the goals of the Earth Institute. We want to raise broader awareness within and beyond UCD of the dynamism of mountains and their role in the SDGs. We wanna promote research on mountain landscapes within UCD and provide a platform for its expansion. We want to establish networks of researchers and relevant agencies within and outside of UCD. 
and support the development of research grant applications and capacity building within the university. And of course, to fulfill the strategic ambitions of our schools, of the Earth Institute and of UCD. Right, and so I'm, I'm here to cover the part about what, what are we actually doing with this, uh, with this program. And so we're really, as Christine mentioned, looking to raise awareness about the mount, mountain rain, landscapes, both within UCD as well as, as in a wider area. And so part of doing that is we're going to be hosting a series of public lectures. We have a few speakers already confirmed. Um, Jonathan Westaway, who's a mountain historian talking about mountaineering in Mount Everest. Um, Eugene Costello will talk about bullying in Ireland and looking at sort of seasonal movement of, of, um, of animals as in, into mountain landscapes. We have Ross Bryce, who's the director of the, mountain, the Center for Mountain Research at Perth. And we have uh, Margaret Jackson, who will be speaking about what can we learn from these mountain environments in terms of, of past climate and things like that. So we'll be recording videos from those lectures. Um, so they're more publicly available to sort of encourage a wider, a wider audience to be able to see them. And we'll also be having short uh, two minute summaries that'll be available. In addition, we're gonna host a stakeholders forum. So a future for Ireland's mountains. Um, where we're going to have some representation from interested stakeholder groups, such as the Irish Uplands Forum and Mountaineering Ireland. And so one outcome from that will be a, a report that will be featured in Mountain Log, which is the, the magazine of Mountaineering Ireland. And additionally, we're also going to have a public facing field trip that will be part of that um, part of that activity. So we'll be going out with stakeholders to look at what some of these mountain landscapes look like from an interdisciplinary perspective. Um, there also will be a virtual component of that, of that field trip. And so really we're looking to sort of build, build a network who are interested in working on mountains and interested in um, sort of looking into different funding agencies. So whether that's the IRC or SFI or other, other groups that may be able to fund um, this interdisciplinary mountain research. Next slide. And so that's, that's just in very brief what, what we're looking to do. Um, and so going forward, we're gonna send around a doodle poll where we'll hope to have a few of you yeah, who might be yeah. interested in talk about your, your interest in research and so and your interest in mountains. And so uh, finally, we'd just like to thank the, the Earth Institute, of course, and uh, specifically uh, Katrina, who has been very helpful in, in our putting this, this project together. Thanks. All right, thanks very much, everyone. Um, we might move straight on to Nessa Winston, who's going to be talking about the Schwell project, and we'll, we'll talk about each of the three projects and then have some questions at, at the end, if that's okay. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about um, our strategic policy priority mechanism on sustainable well-being, humans, environment, and livability. And I'm speaking on behalf of, of the core team who are listed there and our, our research assistant, Fabian Vane. Um, so we start really with uh, the problem that there's no agreed definition of sustainable well-being and that there's a need for an integrated definition, an interdisciplinary integrated one and for interdisciplinary research. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of the, the research that's going on is quite fragmented in UCD and elsewhere. Our objectives are to establish an interdisciplinary network of expertise, both nationally and internationally, to develop conceptual and operational maps of sustainable well-being, and to produce interdisciplinary definition and, and measures um, particularly measures that incorporate both the, the social and environmental, that they be intrinsically linked, and as well to identify key gaps in our knowledge and, and data, data sets. Um, other ones are to establish um, a, a platform for future research programs and uh, reflecting grants and invitations, international collaboration, um, and to communicate with policy makers and practice. Practice, uh, practitioners. Um, so far, the disciplines included are environmental economics, environmental policy, environmental science, psychology, social policy, 
sociology that's just two of us uh, in that category um and then the, we also have subsequently attracted people from business uh, economics and landscape architecture and i i put the sustainable communities research theme there from the earth institute because obviously it's hugely relevant to the work that is ongoing there but there are other research themes in the institute that are hugely relevant obviously the earth environment climate and so on um so the program also in, includes apart from setting up this network of people it's we hope we'll be hosting a series of workshops uh, including international experts policymakers and practitioners um we've already had our first workshop which was a meeting of the core team really where we presenting what our own core interests are and discussing the future work uh, that we might do within um within the group and uh i suppose just to, to give you some flavor of the research interests that come under uh, this heading uh, of the core team would be sustainable communities occupational well-being digital well well-being happiness and so and so on um and when the it was a fascinating discussion, really, and I was thrilled to learn of our shared interests, uh, shared com complementary interests. Um, and what also was wonderful to see is that the very core of what we're interested in is the environment, but linked to whatever else it is that we are interested in, and mainly social, social issues, I suppose, um, at this point. And, one of the things that I was very keen that we would focus on was definition, the issue of definition. And I don't know about you, but I, I get very frustrated with thing, people talking about sustainable communities, and I'm not really sure what we're all talking about. It's the same with sustainable well-being. So I've been, even though I'm a number cruncher, I've been known to be a number cruncher, cruncher, I've really been looking at concepts and theories lately. And um I my own definition and totally open to <laughs> improvement uh, and influenced by the work of Ian Goff and others is that sustainable well-being is about ensuring sufficiency and meeting human needs and it's sufficiency versus wants in order to provide welfare or well-being within planetary boundaries so the important the emphasis on is on meeting basic human needs so people can participate in society but keeping and bearing in mind that notion of sufficiency or of consumption um, to look out for planetary well-being too. Um, then, obviously, how you define things affects how the kind of policies you put in place to um, address it. And I sh should, of course, note that the government and NESC have been doing quite a bit of work on well-being, and that work is ongoing. And um, thanks, I know Anne-Marie McGoran is here from NESC. Thanks for coming along, Anne-Marie. Um, but the in terms of policies, the way I and others see it is that sustainable well-being requires eco-social goals. That is, as Goff defines them, instruments that have both environmental and social goals. Um, that you're reducing emissions and meeting basic needs at the same time. Um, and these are the basic needs of both humans and nature. And um, just following on from that, I'm, I'm embarking on, well, I'm already Im involved in projects on just transitions, which look at transport and residential energy poverty. And those, you, the two issues of social and environmental um, uh sustainability are are at the core um so it's, um it's one illustration orla kelly is also doing a lot of work in this area policy. another fantastic thing that came out of the, the workshop i thought was that we became aware that we're all users of really high quality data sets um two of which are are um international comparative european ones the european quality of life survey which is um the auspices of eurofound based here in dublin european social survey which is based in ucd now as well uh, and which which from bar britain has had um really crucial engagement over time um but there's also some national ones as well um the longitudinal study of aging and, and the longitudinal study of children i'm oh, sorry the other international one is, is share Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement in Europe. So yeah, these, I think our next step is really to have a look 
at the issue of data. Um, so you may well have a, a workshop that, that looks at data and uh, uh, making the most of existing high quality data sets on, in this area. Um, we'll also have a workshop with international speakers and policymakers. Um, so um, another step would be that we want to develop conceptual and operational maps of sustainable wellbeing and we'll develop a website and resources. Um, work in progress. <laughs> we're, we're still working on our next steps, I think. Um, so we're really grateful to the Earth Institute and um, to Will and Taz and everybody for their, their support of it and help along the way. And um, very interested in hearing from you if you're interested in joining us um, or if you know somebody else who would be suitable um if you have any comments or ideas thanks thanks very much indeed nessa um and we'll move on finally then to a parajita banerji who's going to be representing sapphire the third of the projects Um, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this um, coffee session today. So the name of the third um, UCD strategic pri uh, priority um, support mechanism project um, funded in 2021 is SAPBIO. SAPBIO stands for Stakeholders, Attitudes and Perceptions of Biostimulants and Biopesticides. The PI of the project is Dr. Angela Fekin, and there are a couple of co-applicants as well from um, School of Business, School of Biology and the Environmental Sciences, School of Agriculture and Food Sciences, and School of Biosystems and Food Engineering. I'm Aprajita Banerjee, and I am a postdoc at the School of Business. I'm also a co-applicant of this project. Uh, this project is also an extension of a larger uh, project called BioCrop, which has multiple multi-institutional multi partners. So um, currently, crop production is reliant on a high level use of uh, fertilizers and pesticides, and they are used to maintain and ensure yields. Um, millions and millions of tons of fertilizers and pesticides are used to protect plants from diseases and pests. But the use of uh, chemical fertilizers and um, uh, pesticides are, have human health and environmental impacts. They enter human food chain and affect soil and um, water ecosystems. So there are other environmental impacts as well. Conventional fertilizers and plant protection products have other um, detrimental environmental impacts like um, GHG emission from during the manufacturing and use of chemical fertilizers, also fertilizer runoffs in water bodies. Around 80% of the GHG emission in tillage are associated with the manufacture and application of mineral fertilizers. So, so the, to mitigate these problems associated with the increasing dependence of chemical products in crop production, researchers of the SAP bio team is developing two novel biostimulants and biopesticides. The idea behind producing this biopesticides and biostimulants is that it would reduce the use of fossil fuel based fertilizers and pesticides and also control the amount of man-made chemicals being used in food production. However, it is important to know how larger society and stakeholders uh, would accept these new products, especially, especially critical stakeholders groups like farmers, farm product sellers, and consumers. So the SAP Bio project will first map the relevant stakeholders who would be critical actors in the social adoption of these new technologies. 
And then we will engage with the identified stakeholders and through workshops and surveys. And we will inform them in these workshops and surveys, we'll inform them about the products and understand what and why and how they think these products would be acceptable by society in, at large. Okay, so in the pro I'm sorry, in the process, we will also be assessing their willingness to accept this and use this projects and uh, these products. The finding of our of our project will form the basis of an infographic, a policy paper, and it will also lead to further EIP agri focus group application. Um, our project, this project also aligns with multiple, the research needs to meet multiple EU level directives. For example, the European Union Farm to Fork Strategy and as well as the EU, European Union Biodiversity Strategy 2030. All these directives and strategies seeks to reduce the dependency of crop production on the use of pesticides and excess fertilization. The EU has also recently uh, drafted a new regulation to cover all types of fertilizers used, including biostimulants and biofertilizers, coming in, and it will come into force in 2022. Um, this will uh, we 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 think that this will help in the expansion of the biostimulant market in Ireland. So we think our research is very timely and it aligns well with um, opportunities and barriers of uh, adoption of the adoption of biostimulants and biopesticides in Ireland. So we would like to reach out to anyone interested in participating in this project, especially those interested in the various aspects of social acceptance of technology. Um, we, we have already conducted one of our first workshops and it was very successful. We got a ton of feedback from different stakeholder groups. So we are gradually developing our team and I think it will be a great project. We are thankful to Katriona and the whole of Earth Institute for their support. So thank you very much. Here is our email ID. You can contact Angela at angelafeekan at ucd.ie or me at aparajitabanerjee at ucd.ie. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much indeed, Parajita. So th three fantastic projects there and lots of really interesting plans and, and activities already underway. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing projects develop and indeed uh, participating where I can, especially in the mountains, which is close to my heart as well. Um, so does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? I, I have one actually, Nessa, I, is it fair to say that um, kind of well-being is, is kind of been rising in prominence in the, in the kind of policy area in different parts of the world? Would you have any comment on, on kind of where it is in other places and how, how, how embedded it is in, in kind of policy? Yeah, sure. Um, probably um, Orla Kelly, more of an expert on, on other parts of the world, but there's no doubt a more prominent. Um, and I suppose my own feeling is that in, in economics, it became like in social policy, welfare is a really central of what we were doing, and, and, and that, you know, the term is or concept is often used interchangeably. With Promoting, promoting well-being and welfare. And then, you know, in economics, um, there was a move away from using GDP as a measure of welfare and well-being um, and to having a broader, a broader, more multidimensional concept, conception of it. So, you know, um, Steve Litz and Alan, their, their research did have an impact, I guess, on um, the international community and the OECD as a the sound is coming in and out a little bit, Nessa. I don't know. Oh, sorry about that. Hope that didn't happen during the presentation. It didn't know, yeah, but I just missed that last sentence particularly. Oh, sorry. So I suppose, yeah, like international organizations like the OECD work on it, um, and different governments in different parts of the world have um, in Europe. 
Still a little bit um, hazy there. I can jump in if it's helpful, if Nessa, is that okay? <laughs> um, okay. Just in terms, I, I think Taz, what uh, Nessa was saying a little bit from, um, in general, post kind of 2009 financial crisis kind of movement more largely away from GDP to kind of thinking more holistically about how countries can think about how their uh, nation states are doing beyond measures of gross domestic product. And the OECD brought out this framework um, and invested a huge amount of money and um, kind of um, resources in general uh, into this getting this framework together and, and gather a lot of data among OECD nations and then kind of beyond others have taken it on as well to, to get this kind of broad understanding of well-being, well-being research and that kind of has petered out I think um, and, and then of course increasingly you know there's a movement towards incorporating um, environmental well-being into that and kind of um, respecting the interconnectedness there. I think that's so much you're saying it too, Nessa, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask? Anybody? So I have a question for Graham. Um, I have like students interested in mountain research. So I was just wondering if master students can be a part of the MRG in UCD or they can like, you know, there, 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 are, there is a lot of students who are climbers in, in UCD and they, when I told them about your project, they were kind of interested in being, knowing more about your project and being part of the group. So. Do you think I can lead them to you or to anyone in the group? Christine, Sam, do either of you want to answer that? I'm, I'm happy to do so, but also happy if you if you would prefer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, the, the the yeah, I mean the, the idea of the mountain research group is that it would be open to anybody who mm -hmm. has in in mountain research at UCD. So definitely I would think that master students can have a role to play in that. And it's about making it's about making connections between people and that very interdisciplinary study. So yeah, we, we'll send around the doodle poll and please do send that on to send that on to others. I was, I was actually just struck listening to, to Nessa and Orla there that obviously mountains have a role in well-being as well. And the access to mountain landscapes, um, particularly for tourism and leisure, is widely perceived as having a significant role in well-being. So there are there are other links between some of these priorities as well. Yeah, and I was also thinking like Bhutan is such an example of like, you know, gross national happiness and it's mountains and it's like well-being. So it's kind of yeah, yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're kind of like the model that we all <laughs> we all yes. pointed. They were one of the first yeah. ones to do. And then the OECD came with their money and then it's a you know a big deal. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. absolutely Bhutan has, has been doing this for a while. Yeah, there's also the Buen Vivir model that in, in Latin America. So there are some interesting examples from the global south of uh, yeah. you know, beyond gross domestic product approaches to development and to well-being. Definitely. A question of Graeme and um, Christine. Uh, just wondering, I mean, you, you mentioned access to, to mountains and um, as part of well-being. And I think it's just interesting. We have a PhD student looking at wilderness. And basically, it's almost you know, to try and protect wilderness, it's almost the opposite. You want to restrict access. You want to make, keep these areas pristine, uh, try and keep the, you know, mass tourism out of it. I just wonder how, or is, is it possible to reconcile those two? You know, are we doing damage to biodiversity, to ecology, if, you know, a, a million tourists, like you can see what's happening with, uh, with Mount, Ever Mount Everest and the massive tourism there and some of the issues. Um, I just wonder what your, your, your thought on that is. Who wants to go first on that one? And Sam as well. I don't mind. <laughs> off, off you go, Christine. Okay, well, um, I think it's a really good question, Finbar. Um, I, I think there may be good examples with the uh, co-management approaches to conservation to look at. Um, so this is people that live in the buffer zone or live 
even continue to use, let's say, national parks. Um, there are a lot of good examples of that from Vietnam where it's gone wrong, um, but also there are some good examples, I think, um, of it working well. Um, recently, there have been developments in the concept of relational values to try and get away from this idea of valuing nature either as a for its use value alone or for its intrinsic value to understand how you know, people's relationships with the environment are far more complex. Um, and in, in many cases, there are reasons why people try to maintain a more sustainable relationship with nature. So it's not always just bad and exploitation. And there may be a way to enable use to continue of these of these um, fragile landscapes. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the only thing I'd, I'd add is, and is that is that William Murphy, the PhD student you're mentioning, Fimba? Is, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've been in touch with him about about a couple of things, but the you, you see examples of it very clearly in the Wicklow Mountains at the moment. The the need to balance out the the preservation of that landscape, the maintenance of the character of that landscape, with the enormous numbers of tourists visiting. And there's a a major Fulcher Island master plan to to really restructure people's experience of the Wicklow Mountains. And that's a, a really interesting and complex process to be, to be involved in, particularly around the, the big problem they have is the kind of honeypot sites like Glendalock, um, which have enormous problems in terms of how you manage and structure those landscapes. And they're exactly the sorts of debates that need all of those different perspectives in there, trying to balance out the different, the different requirements. So it's a really, really difficult thing to resolve and a really good question to ask. Time for one more question, if anybody has one. Uh, Jennifer? Yes, I'm really sorry that this is actually a comment. Um, so if there is another question, please, somebody should go. All right. But I was just I was just reflecting, Graham, as you were speaking there about about well-being, you know, not only can, and Finbar's comment about can mountains and biodiversity influence well-being, well, I also think it can go the other way around. So human well-being should also channel into the preservation <clears throat> of, of, you know, natural areas and into how we approach agriculture. And I think if you see well-being as a process, not as an outcome, then it's the process, the active, agentic process of constructing well-being in our communities that should actually channel into as well as feed from these um, these natural resources. That was just my thought as we were talking. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Yeah, no, that's really a powerful thought, I think. And actually, the the, the last couple of comments I think have been a, a nice way of kind of framing the the, the 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 overarching thinking around around these kinds of topics. So yeah, I think it's been a really interesting session, and I, it's a shame there's not more time. For discussion but I, there, there will be time over the next year and a half or so as the projects run their course to, to hear more from them and to get involved so I, I do hope uh, many of you will, will get involved as much as possible I certainly hope to somewhere along the line so uh, I'd like to thank the speakers again and thank everyone for participating and I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, coffee morning thanks very much